The late 1800s and mid-1900s experienced an era when the idea of imperialism became common. Some stronger, more powerful nations had already started making colonies and territories, but a new nation was taking that idea and transforming into a world power, America. America began to make colonies around the world, an idea already embraced by other nations. America's change into an imperialist country affected many people around the world, especially in North America. For many people, it was the start of a new, promising era. But for other people, it was the start of a disastrous, dark, and cruel era. An era that would completely change their lifestyle, drive them out of their land, and make the issue of discrimination against them even worse than it already had been. Before we can get any further, what is imperialism anyway? Well, imperialism is when stronger, more powerful countries exercise control over weaker territories by extending political and economical control. Several countries, primarily in Europe, had territories in areas such as Africa, South America, Asia, and Canada. But why would imperialist nations make territories? The main reason was because the homeland could run out of natural resources. With the colonies and territories, the home country could import items, not worry about running out of supplies, and gain access to valuable resources such as tea, rubber, iron, petroleum, and other stuff. This is an example of extractive economies, in which imperial countries extracted or removed raw materials from the colony and shipped them to the home country. However, America had different motives for gaining colonies and territories. For one, People started believing that in order for the U.S. to prosper, they would have to start colonizing the world. This was due to their belief in social Darwinism, which stated that only the fittest in the species survived. They believed that if America was to sit around while the rest of the world made territories and colonies, America would not survive for long. Another motive was that America had too many resources in the mainland, which led to overproducing, which also meant that profits would start declining. In order to solve this, America needed to find new markets. In order to do this, the USA needed to become a world power and increase influence throughout the world, particularly the Pacific Ocean. However, in order for imperialist nations to expand and to protect their interests abroad, a strong military was required, particularly a navy. One of the many people who strongly thought this was Alfred T. Mahan, and he advised America to develop a strong navy. He argued that in the past, other successful imperialist countries had, had had large and effective navies. He urged the US, United States to build a modern naval fleet. This idea was shared with several other people, and by 1900, America had the third largest navy in the world. This benefited the United States greatly, as they ha had now become a world power. Many people believed in racial, national, and cultural superiority of the Anglo-Saxon race. They considered it their responsibility to civilize lesser areas. This idea can be referred to as the Manifest Destiny, which stated that God had given them the task of civilizing the world. This greatly influenced how the U.S. treated the Indian tribes in the West and other natives living in the lands they acquired. The first step towards expanding American influence came before the Civil War, when Commodore Perry sailed ships into Tokyo Bay in 1858. Before this, Japan had been closed out from other countries and refused to trade due to their fear of opium. As a rule, the emperors had completely cut off trade with any country, not even letting ships resupply if they sailed into Japan's harbors. Commodore Perry changed that. He sailed straight into Tokyo Bay with several ships behind him, all armed with cannons and guns. Commodore Perry requested for Japan to open their ports to trade with the world. He did not openly threaten them while negotiating. But, the Japanese realized the danger they would put themselves in if they refused to trade with the U.S. In the end, Commodore Perry successfully negotiated an agreement that opened Japanese ports to American ships. Japan eventually adopted America's ideas and became an imperialist nation itself. This set the precedent for further expansion of the U.S., and America took possession of the Midway Islands in 1867. In order to continue to expand influence around the world, the U.S. needed strategic naval bases to refuel and resupply their fleet.
Another step in expansion was the purchase of Alaska. In 1867, the Secretary of State William Seward purchased Alaska from the Russians for $7.2 million. Many people thought of this move as unwise because they did not see any benefit. However, Alaska's purchase proved to be a benefit. Alaska is rich in several rare and valuable resources such as timber, oil, and other items. Since the 1790s, there has always been an American presence in Hawaii. Even though Hawaii was technically not part of the U.S. until about a century later, several ships headed there to resupply before heading further into the Pacific, while some ships stopped there to settle down. There were some missionaries who established Christian churches and schools. There were also whites who became sugarcane planters, most of them becoming rather wealthy in the islands. However, these planters were rather prejudiced against the native Hawaiians. In 1887, the white planters convinced the Hawaiian ruler, King Kalakana, to amend the Hawaiian constitution so that only the wealthy landowners could vote, which basically excluded everyone except for the white settlers, most of which owned sugarcane plantations. Then, in the early 1890s, the white planters faced two crises. The first was that the U.S. tariff on Hawaiian sugar made it more expensive than sugar grown in the U.S., which threatened to decrease their profits. Also, King Kalakana died and was succeeded by his sister, Queen Lil Liluokalani. She was a Hawaiian nationalist who resented the power of the white majority in the islands, so she abolished the constitution that had given the power to rich whites. In retaliation, the white planters moved quickly to get back at the queen. With, help, with backing from the U.S. officials and the help of John Stevens, the U.S. Minister of Hawaii, and also help from the U.S. Marines, the white settlers seized power from, of Hawaii, and the queen was overthrown and placed under house arrest. The leader of the rebels, Sanford B. Dole, asked the president of the U.S., Benjamin Harrison, to annex Hawaii into America. Harrison agreed with the idea, but was unable to get the Senate's approval for the Treaty, treaty of Annexation, and left the and left office right after right after right before he could see it through. And his successor, Grover Cleveland, was left to finish the job. Cleveland was not eager to annex Hawaii into the states, and he ordered an investigation. The investigation proved that the majority of the Hawaiians did not want an annexation. annexation. Cleveland refused to sign the agreement and apologized to the Hawaiians for Stevens' behavior. However, in 1897, William McKinley was elected president. He favored annexation, and, and in 1898, with the outbreak of the Spanish-American War, Hawaii, Hawaii was annexed and became a U.S. territory. Since the Mexican-American War, America was reluctant to acquire colonies by means of war. However, this changed when the United States declared war on Spain in 1898. By then, America had acquired several colonies and become a world power. There were three main reasons combined that brought about the Spanish-American War. 1. An over-sensational press reportings inflamed America. 2. The Cuban Rebellion against Spain. Three the sweeping spirit of imperialism among U U.S. leaders. By 1898, Spain began to lose influence as well as a lot of their colonies. However, the Spanish still held on to the Fili Philippine Islands in the Pacific, and also Cuba and Puerto Rico in the Caribbean. American investors began investing in Cuba's sugarcane industry, so there were many sugarcane plantations owned by U.S. businessmen. In 1895, Cubans, under the leadership of Jose Marti, rebelled against the Spanish. The rebels used guerrilla tactics of hit and run raids to confuse and demoralize the Spanish troops. In response, the Spanish General Waylord decided to implement a plan that would deprive the rebels of food and resources. He placed populations of rural areas into concentration camps, where thousands of people died of disease and shortage of resources. During the fighting, Many American properties were destroyed. Some people in the U.S. mainland were sympathetic with the Cuban rebels, while some businesses hoped that the Spanish could quell the rebellion and return the island to status quo.
many prominent newspapers in the competition for readership engaged in printing stories and cartoons and exaggerating the atrocities committed by Spain. This type of press was called Yellow Press because it featured a comic strip character called the Yellow Kid. The reporting had a hard effect. It stirred the emotions of Americans to be sympathetic towards Cuba's rebels that were seeking independence. President McKinley warned Spain that they had better put an end to the fighting and establish peace in Cuba, even sending the battleship Maine to Havana Harbor to protect U.S. interests and people in Cuba. As a result, Spain called General Whaler to offer the Cuban rebels some reforms. However, the rebels would accept nothing other than independence, something Spain would not grant them. In February of 1898, the Cuban rebels intercepted a private letter written by Enrique Dupuy de Lomi, Spain's ambassador to Washington, D.C., and leaked it through the press. In the letter, de Lomi criticized McKinley, calling him weak and stupid. This letter fueled the United States' aggressive nationalism and angered many people. The battleship Maine mysteriously blew up in Havana Harbor on February 15, 1898, killing more than 250 American sailors. The press immediately blamed Spain for the sinking, which inflamed public opinion and moved the U.S. closer to war. Songs and speeches began to include the slogan, Remember the Maine. Under pressure from U.S. demands, Spain agreed to disband the concentration camps and make other concessions in Cuba. However, it was already too late. In April 11, 1898, President McKinley asked Congress to, for the authority to use force against Spain to end the fighting in Cuba. McKinley clarified the reason for doing this by saying, in the name of humanity, in the name of civilization, in behalf of endangered American interests. Eight days later, Congress enacted four resolutions with, which amounted to the declaration of war against Spain. The last one, the Teller Amendment, stipulating that America would not annex Cuba into the United States. McKinley called for 100,000 volunteers to join the army. The Navy quickly moved to close off all Cuban ports. The Americans responded enthusiastically, their motions aflame due to the press. Over 200,000 people volunteered for army service, up from the original 25,000 that enlisted at the beginning of 1898. In May, Americans heard that the U.S. had scored a great naval victory, but not in Cuba, but out in the Pacific Ocean on the opposite side of the world. On May 1st, Commodore George Dewey sailed his U.S. fleet into Manila Bay in the Philippines. He promptly destroyed the Spanish fleet that was caught by surprise in the bay. Meanwhile, the Philippine rebels, under the leadership of Emilio Aguinaldo, were fighting the Spanish for Philippine independence. 15,000 U.S. troops aided the rebels, and by August, the Spanish troops surrendered in the islands. The Americans were elated with the amazing victory short, so short into the war and declared Dewey a national hero. In June, 17,000 U.S. soldiers landed in Cuba and quickly captured Guantanamo Bay. Under General William Shafter, the army troops stormed ashore east of Santiago. The U.S. troops, however, were poorly trained and supplied. As they assembled near Tampa, Florida for deployment to Cuba, many were issued obsolete equipment and wool uniforms unsuited for the tropical climate of Cuba. The corrupt and inefficient of officials provided the troops with rotting and contaminated food. General Shafter's army was an interesting mix of National Guard units with regular army units, including African American 9th and 10th Cavalry units, and volunteer units like the Rough Riders under Theodore Roosevelt. The Rough Riders were rugged Westerners and upper class Easterners. The Rough Riders became famous for the battles of Kettle and San Juan Hills, in which, with the help of the 9th and 10th Cavalry units, stormed the crest of the hill to capture the high ground against Santiago. Two days after the Battle of San Juan Hill, the Spanish army attempted to bust the blockade around Santiago. In the process, their ships were completely destroyed. This disaster, along with being outnumbered and dispirited, led to the Spanish forces to surrender. The U.S. fought a few more battles, occupying Puerto Rico and a few other Spanish possessions. When the fighting came to an end, 3,000 Americans had died in the conflict, but only 380 actually died on the battlefield, while the rest died of disease, especially malaria and yellow fever. After the war, one of the immediate questions was, what was the United States to do with all of Spain's former possessions? 
Treaty of Paris signed by Spain and the U.S. in the December of 1898 officially ended the Spanish-American War. It also gave American control of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Pacific Island of Guam to the U.S. Spain also sold the Philippines to the U.S. for $20 million. The Teller Amendment that was passed by Congress did not allow the U.S. to take control of Cuba, but it didn't forbid the Philippines or any other of the countries. America debated on whether or not the U.S. should grant the Philippines independence and self-rule. Many political leaders in the U.S. believed that the Filipinos did, did not have a sufficient development in civilization nor to rule themselves. Many imperialists argued that the U.S. had the responsibility to govern the Filipinos until they were ready for self-rule. They also saw the Philippines as a stepping stone to trade with China. They said that if they gave up the Philippines, another nation was sure to come in and control the island. However, anti-imperialists, including William Jennings Bryan and Mark Twain as well, disagreed. They formed the Anti-Imperialist League, which considered imperialism a crime and open disloyalty to, to distinctive principles of our government. Imperialists and anti-imperialists debated on the floor of the U.S. Senate as they considered the ratification of the Treaty of Paris. The treaty was approved by a 46 to 27 vote. By a single yes, the vote two-thirds threshold was met for ratification. In 1900, McKinley ran for re-election against William Jennings Bryan. McKinley named Theodore Roosevelt, the hero of the Battle of San Juan Hill, as vice president to bolster his chances of winning. McKinley ran on a nationalist and imperialist footing and soundly defeated Bryan, who was, as I mentioned earlier, an anti-imperialist. McKinley's re-election showed the support of Americans towards imperialism and the U.S. becoming a world power. After the Spanish-American War, the U.S. emerged as a nation that had an empire and enjoyed a new statute in world affairs. The war marked a turning point in the history of American foreign policy. The leaders in the American government decided that they could not leave the Philippines to its people for self-rule because they believed that the Filipinos were not developed enough for self-rule. Americans also wanted to open China and other Asian markets to American goods as well as increase the benefits of the U.S. culture to people of that region. East Asia eventually brought an increase of power and wealth to Americans. However, it also increased tensions with countries in Asia. The Filipino rebels, under the command of the nationalist leader Emilio Aguinaldo, fought alongside the U.S. against the Spanish during the Spanish-American War. At the war's end, Aguinaldo had every hope that America would turn the reins of government to him and the Philippine government. However, after the U.S. decided to maintain possession of the Philippines, Aguinaldo grew dis disillusioned with the American leaders and helped organize an insurrection. The Filipinos believed they were fighting for the same reason as the U.S. against King George during the Revolutionary War. Insurgents under Aguinaldo were completely outnumbered by the U.S. troops, so they resorted to guerrilla tactics to fight. By the way, guerrilla tactics are engaging the enemy in small numbers and attacking behind enemy lines so that the small forces can disappear into the jungle before the enemy can engage in response. Pretty clever, huh? Well. This resulted in the American commanders not knowing which of the Filipinos were engaged in the rebel bands and which were not. So they rounded up entire villages and placed the people in, in, con in concentration camps. Ironically, this was the exact same method the Spanish had used in Cuba during the Cuban Rebellion. In the spring of 1901, the U.S. troops captured Aguinaldo, an act that spelled the end of the insurrections in the Philippines. The war in the Philippines, unfortunately, had taken more lives than the Spanish-American War. Around 5,000 Americans died, and, but the war cost the Filipinos around 200,000 lives. At the height of the war, there were approximately 100,000 American soldiers fighting against the Filipino forces. In 1901, William Howard Taft, the man who would later succeed Teddy Roosevelt as president, became the civil governor of the Philippines, replacing the military governor. Taft made a big attempt to help the islands recover from the war. He placed dissidents in jail and censored the press in order to maintain order. However, he extended limited self-rule and ordered the construction of schools, roads, and bridges. In 1916, Cong Congress passed the Jones Act, 
which pledged that the Philippines would ultimately gain independence. 30 years later, at the end of World War II in the Pacific, this became a reality. U.S. businessmen saw Latin America as a region to be exploited for profit. Latin America was considered as America's backyard. The U.S. politicians promoted a foreign policy of aggression toward other nations that might have tried to gain an economic foothold in the region. This attitude and the set of circumstances led to an anti-American hostility and instability in Latin America. At the end of the Spanish-American War, the Puerto Rican and Cuban people were freed from Spain. However, the fate of Puerto Rico was unresolved. Should they become independent countries or become colonies of the United States? In 1900, Congress passed the Foraker Act, which established civil government in Puerto Rico. The act authorized the president to appoint a governor and establish part of the Puerto Rican legislature. The Puerto Ricans filled the rest of the legislature through a general election. The issue of Puerto Ricans having U.S. citizenship remained unresolved for some time. This situation led to a series of court cases called insular cases to determine the rights of Puerto Ricans. For example, the Supreme Court ruled that the U.S. government should tax the Puerto Rican goods sold in the mainland. Many Puerto Ricans were unhappy about this as they did not share the same rights as American citizens. In 1917, Woodrow Wilson signed the jones shafroth Act, which granted the Puerto Ricans more citizenship rights and more control over their own legislator. The Treaty of Paris granted Cuba independence, but U.S. troops occupied and were in control of the island until 1902. Before the army left, the Cubans were forced to add the Platt Amendment to their constitution. The Platt Amendment had the following stipulations with the Cubans sort of disliked. The Platt Amendment prevented the Cubans from signing a treaty with another nation without U.S. approval. It also required Cuba to lease naval stations to America. And it granted the United States the right to intervene in order to preserve order in Cuba. The Platt Amendment was added to the Cuban Constitution because the Americans wanted to prevent the possibility of Cuba became, becoming a base of a potentially hostile great power. The Platt Amendment governed the relationship between the U.S. and Cuba for decades. Theodore Roosevelt had the view that it was America's destiny to civilize and strengthen lesser nations in their sphere of influence, which included nations in the Caribbean and Latin America. He is known to use an African proverb which said, Speak softly and carry a big stick. It will get you far. Roosevelt also believed that the U.S. statesmen and industry leaders should embrace the challenge of international leadership. Roosevelt played a crucial role in the development of the Panama Canal. In 1903, America bought canal route rights from a French company for $40 million. However, in order to actually build the canal, the U.S. needed to gain consent from the Colombian government. The efforts to negotiate an agreement were stalled when Colombia demanded more money than the U.S. was willing to pay. As a result, Roosevelt stepped in by sending U.S. warships to the waters of, off Panama to support the Panamanian rebel rebellion against Colombia going on at that time. The presence of U.S. warships convinced the Colombians not to suppress the rebellion. Panama soon after declared independence from Colombia. The new nation of Panama quickly agreed to grant the U.S. control of the canal zone. To secure the land for its vital trade link, the U.S. agreed to pay Panama $10 million in an annual rent of $250,000. The construction of the Panama Canal was a monumental engineering feat, but it cost many lives due to poor air quality and mosquitoes, which produced malaria in the jungles of Panama. In order to get from one ocean to the other, the engineers devised a system of locks to float the ships up 85 feet to Gatun Lake, which spanned the isthmus. Once the canal was finished, it cut the voyage from coast to coast by 45 days. In 1900, U.S. lawmakers started to fear that European nations carrying loans for Latin American countries might intervene in those countries to collect debts. America did not want European influence in Latin American countries, however. Under President Monroe, the U.S. government ha had adopted a foreign policy that in order to protect U.S. interests, all European countries were encouraged to stay out of Latin America. In 
The Monroe Doctrine was America's first attempt to keep in European influence out of the Western Hemisphere. As a result of the present crisis, Roosevelt decided it would be best if the U.S. intervened instead to solve the Latin American debt crisis. If a Latin American country was guilty of chronic wrongdoing, which might invite European intervention, the U.S. would assume the role of a police force, restoring order and depriving other creditors of the excuse to intervene. I'm just sitting here I got time It's clear to see From up here The world seems small We can sit together It's so beautiful You and me to be in the great outdoors forever free step back to see the truth around you from a distance you can tell you and me were meant to be 